Remember Acer? They were the computer brand that took the Western market by storm in the late 2000s and early 2010s. They were the leader of the Asian computer boom along with Lenovo and Asus. And during the peak in 2009, they controlled over 13% of the entire global computer market, which made them the second best-selling computer brand, only beaten out by HP. But unlike Lenovo and Asus, who have been able to consistently grow their market share, Acer has been consistently bleeding market share. In fact, by the end of 2014, Acer was no longer even in the top 5 best-selling computer brands. And today, Acer's market share stands at just 6.7%, or roughly half of their peak, and their fundamentals have fallen even harder. Their revenue has fallen from $20 billion to just over $7 billion. Their net income, funnily enough, hasn't fallen by much because Acer never really made much to begin with. They've always been floating around to break even. As you might guess though, investors haven't viewed this performance too kindly, leading to the company falling from an $8 billion market cap to as low as a $1 billion market cap. Acer stock has recovered a good amount since then, but they're still only halfway to their highs, and that's not even accounting for inflation. But what even happened to Acer? If you look around the electronics space, we'll see that it's still largely dominated by Asian brands. The TV market, for example, is controlled by Sony, Samsung, LG, and most recently TCL, who didn't even enter the North American market till 2013. And within the PC industry itself, Lenovo, an Asian brand, is the market leader, controlling a quarter of the entire market. So it's not like Asian brands as a whole have fallen off, but just Acer. So what happened to Acer? Taking a look back, the story of Acer takes us back to a Taiwanese man named Stan Chi. After completing a bachelor's and master's in electronics engineering, in 1976, Stan teamed up with his wife and five of his friends to create an electronics company called Multitech International. While the company was basically just a garage startup, they actually had access to quite a bit of capital. All of the founders had pretty successful engineering and business careers before starting Multitech, so they were able to pull together a solid $25,000. That's the same as roughly $135,000 today. Using that capital, Multitech was able to hire some employees and become an electronics consultant and distributor, specializing in microprocessors. For the first few years, this is pretty much all they did, but their trajectory would largely change after the release of the Apple II. Let's just say that Multitech was quite intrigued by how Apple was targeting the consumer market with friendly looking computers. Naturally, they wanted to do something similar with their own unique twist, which led to the creation of the Microprofessor MPF-1. This was unlike any computer you've ever seen. Instead of being a big white box, the Microprofessor was kind of a tablet that came in a transparent plastic box. The idea was that the computer kind of looked like an audio cassette and could blend into a bookshelf. This computer launched in 1981 for $150 and it would go on to be a massive success. In fact, it would sell for the next 12 years, making it one of the longest selling computers of all time. But after creating this unique masterpiece, Multitech would take the easy way out with their next computer, the Microprofessor 2. This computer was a blatant ripoff of the Apple II. In fact, one of the only differences between the Microprofessor 2 and the Apple II was that the Microprofessor could render Chinese text, which was ironically quite difficult to do given that there are thousands of Chinese characters. Multitech took a similar approach with their next computer as well, the Microprofessor 3. Instead of copying Apple though, this time they largely copied IBM's personal computer, only their version was less than half the price starting at just $700. These astonishingly low prices made them quite popular in Western markets, leading to a new name and a market strategy in 1987, Acer. The value proposition of Acer was extremely straightforward. They produced the same computers that Western brands produced, only for cheaper. While their computers generally offered a great value for the price, if you took price out of the equation, there wasn't much going for them. But that was okay because that's exactly what the market wanted. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, computers were progressing at record speed. Processors were constantly doubling in speed and RAM usage went to the moon. But not only were computers getting a lot faster, their applications were also rapidly expanding. 
We saw the rise of the internet, browsers, email, floppy disks, online media, travel portals, and so much more. And it didn't stop right there either. Computers were not only becoming faster and more useful, but they were also getting a lot cheaper as well. The brand that was leading this trend was Dell, who was constantly pushing the boundaries when it came to price. I think you can see how all of this was quite overwhelming for the average person, who had a tough time keeping up with the rate of innovation. No matter what computer they bought, it would become completely outdated in terms of speed, applications, and price within just two years. So given the short lifespan, most people just bought the cheapest computers they could get, which was usually from Dell, HP, or Compaq. Acer was by no means the leader of this cycle, but they very much benefited given that their main selling point was just price. In the meantime, brands that had pricier flagship computers like Apple and IBM got obliterated. This is why IBM completely exited the consumer PC market, and why Apple nearly went bankrupt before Steve Jobs returned and turned around the company. Moving into the 2000s, this trend would simply go into overdrive, as consumers reached maximum computer fatigue. This was only made worse by the fact that global PC shipments would peak out in the late 2000s. This meant that most PC buyers were no longer new buyers, but rather repeat buyers who just wanted the absolute cheapest thing they could get their hands on, leading to an unprecedented run for Acer. Acer didn't even become a top 5 computer brand till the end of 2003 when they controlled about 3% of the market. But within just the next 5.5 years, their market share would quadruple to over 13%. It was the same thing that happened in the 1990s, but on the next level. Instead of Dell, HP, and Compaq kicking out Apple and IBM, it was Acer, Lenovo, and Asus kicking out Dell and HP. So really, Acer's success had less to do with some sort of unique brand positioning or value add, and much more to do with just market sentiment. It just so happened that the market sentiment throughout the 90s and 2000s largely favored price, allowing Acer to rise to the top. Seeing this, most predicted that the computer industry would become an infinite race to the bottom, similar to the TV industry, where only Asian brands can compete. But that's not exactly what happened. Moving into the 2010s, the entire PC industry got a fresh breath of air due to three reasons, starting with the rise of smartphones. Smartphones almost single-handedly revitalized the consumer tech spirit. For the first time in a long time, people were excited about these mini computers. They went out of their way to buy these devices because they wanted to experience them, not just because their computer was outdated for the fifth time this decade. Steve Jobs built upon this interest and launched the MacBook Air in early 2008, which was one of the first notable computer launches since the 80s really. By this point, the rest of the industry had just evolved into a bunch of serial numbers that all looked the same, like the Dell Latitude 5490. Apple was just one part of the puzzle though. The second part of the puzzle was achieving peak computer. Now, technically, transistors and processors continued going to the moon, but for the first time, this didn't really matter for the average person because they simply didn't need the extra power. In fact, the only thing that most people needed was an internet connection, leading to the rise of Chromebooks. It wasn't just computer specs that were starting to peak out either, but also computer form factors. Computers went from being white boxes, to being black boxes, to being rectangular prisms, to being laptops, which is still how it is for most people to this day. As such, people started keeping their computers for 4, 5, 6 years at a time before upgrading. In fact, the current average is 5.63 years, and it's expected to grow to 6.54 years by 2027. Also, I would speculate that those figures are actually being averaged down by corporations and schools, who tend to replace their computers much more frequently. So the real average amongst consumers may already be closer to 7 years. Why does this matter, you ask? Well, it completely changes how people view a computer purchase. Nowadays, people see a new computer as a 5-7 to seven year investment, as opposed to an everyday commodity, which is what computers were becoming back in the 2000s. As such, they're much more willing to spend more on each computer purchase given that they're less frequent, leading to pure budget brands like Acer largely falling out of favor. And that brings us into the third and likely most important factor, which is the evolving significance of computers. Back in the 90s and 2000s, most consumers bought computers so that they could email their friends, scroll through Friendster, play simple online games, and Google stuff. In other words, computers were a discretionary, leisurely purchase. 
But moving into the 2000s and especially after the pandemic, computers have become a vital part of most people's income and livelihood, regardless of profession. Whether you're a music teacher or a doctor or a police officer or a plumber, you likely have some sort of productive use case with computers on a day-to-day -day basis. So why cheap out? This seems to be the modern sentiment around computers, resulting in demand for Acer falling off a cliff. The bottom line is that Acer never really built a brand, and this is the biggest shortfall between Acer and every other computer brand. On one side, you've got your Apple sheeps with Macs, which I'm very much a part of, but you can say the same thing about every other brand as well. I mean, have you ever seen the Lenovo ThinkPad community? Those guys swear by the ThinkPad and hail Linux ThinkPads as the best productivity machine of all time. It's the same thing with Asus, except instead of appealing to the productivity community, Asus appeals to the gaming community. Pictures like these tell you everything you need to know about just how strong the Asus brand is. I should note that these are not promotional pictures from Asus. These are hardcore Asus fans building Asus themed setups with their own money. And if you're not an Apple sheep, Linux nerd, or enthusiast gamer, you're probably just looking for a good value computer, which you can get from HP or Dell. Both of these guys have cut their consumer margins to basically zero and transitioned into being an enterprise business, so it's hard to beat them in terms of value. And that pretty much covers the entire modern consumer computer market. There's simply no room for brands like Toshiba, Acer, Sony, and even Samsung. That's why most of them left the consumer-facing PC business. The market had segmented itself into a few key sectors and these brands simply no longer had a clear fit, and this isn't due to a lack of effort. Acer, for example, has very much been trying to break into the gaming market, and they've done a decent job, just not enough to displace the leader, Asus. And I think that pretty much sums up the entire history of Acer. They started off cloning Apple and IBM computers, and to this day, they're still trying to clone the success of others. At one point, that approach actually proved to be quite fruitful, but that didn't last forever, leading to the current state of Acer, a brand lost in time. Unlike Acer, TCL has managed to go past being just the cheap brand. Check out this video to learn more, but until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.